Many people ask me, what can I do to age gracefully? Or what can I do to stay young longer? How do I reverse aging? Where do I even start with the anti-aging? In the previous video, I was telling you about three categories of anti-aging interventions. The best and most logical place to start anti-aging efforts is with the measures corresponding to the first category, anti-aging from the inside or healthy lifestyle. Many of the health and aging issues that people are attempting to ameliorate with medicine, supplements, biohacking can be improved with those anti-aging from the inside measures. And they can be improved in a much more fine-tuned way thanks to the body's innate intelligence. In this video, I will be telling you about such measures. I will share with you easy steps that you can start undertaking right now to stay young longer and live longer. With these steps, you can easily add years of disability-free life. Many of them are either free or do not require spending a lot of money. This video will be packed with the information, so you may want to get pen and paper or save the video for your future reference. Also, if you find the information in this video useful and if in your opinion other people may benefit from listening to it, consider liking the video or subscribing to the channel because supposedly that's how the YouTube algorithm knows to offer the video to suggest the video to more people with an interest similar to yours. The content for today and how I will structure it. First, I will list all the pillars of the anti-aging. Then, for each of the pillars, I will briefly describe why it is important, how it impacts longevity, and what it should be like ideally to maximize the lifespan and the health span. Briefly, because there is so much information that I had to cut down and cut down from what I really wanted to include here. If you hear an aspect that's of a particular interest to you, leave me a comment to the video. You'll help me prioritize on which video to create next. Third, for each of the pillars of the anti-aging, I will give you a list of suggestions, small and easy steps that you can start implementing right now to stay young longer and live longer. Most of them are small and easy changes, but if you follow them consistently, it will make a big difference. Also, implementing any health or anti-aging related changes, it's not about what, it's about how. How many people who don't exercise never heard of the benefits of exercising, and yet they don't exercise? What is the value of knowledge if a person is not using it? For this reason, some of the tips that I will be offering along the way will be on how. How to work around the animal part of our brain and how to appeal to consciousness to actually implement the anti-aging measures. For those who are already at an advanced level or want more information, I will also give some more complex suggestions with more advanced information. Finally, you may already be very solid with some of those anti-aging components or anti-aging pillars. In the description to this video, I will timestamp the sections of the video so that you can navigate straight to the ones of the most interest to you. So what are the pillars of anti-aging? What hundreds if not thousands of scientific studies have uncovered and confirmed are the factors that at a high level you likely heard or read about. The first one is psychological and emotional health and well-being. The parts of it are stress management, maintaining meaningful social connections, life purpose, and some sort of spirituality frequently linked with the life purpose. This is anti-aging 101, that's why I grouped them together. In reality, each of the above is big enough to be viewed as a separate item. And then the other pillars of anti-aging are sleep, nutrition, physical activity, 
getting sufficient sunlight, avoiding toxins, and finally, cognitive health. The cognitive health is not necessarily a standalone driver of longevity. Nonetheless, it's the very essence of living. If you have all of the above taken care of, you are significantly ahead of many people and you are on your way to the maximum or near maximum health span and lifespan given to you when you were born. If any of the above factors are in the orange or red zone, the person is shortening his or her life. At a high level, that's all there is. But as an old saying goes, the good Lord is in detail. And we are going to take small dives into some details. Let's start with the sleep, one of my favorites. Will you not agree that it feels amazing waking up refreshed after a good night's sleep? It's also one of my favorites because sleep along with the psychological well-being is frequently not given sufficient weight in the health and anti-aging discussions. In a nutshell about sleep and why we need it. Majority of adults need five cycles of sleep. On average, that's four to six. Each cycle lasts approximately 90 minutes and hence the magic number of seven to eight hours of sleep per night that you probably heard about. The sleep cycle consists of five stages. Frequently stages three and four are grouped together and you will hear about four stages of a sleep cycle. The duration of each stage within the cycle changes through the night. The last stage is REM, rapid eye movement. The first three or four stages are non-REM. Every stage of sleep is important, every stage plays its role. However, experts believe that it is a deep sleep stage that's critical for the body recovery, for the body growth, for the resetting of the immune system, cell regeneration, release of certain hormones, etc. The deep sleep stage, also called delta wave stage or N3 stage, is the longest earlier in the night. During the early sleep cycles, that stage lasts for 20 to 40 minutes. As you continue sleeping, the deep stage gets shorter and the REM stage gets longer. So take a note that to get restorative sleep, you need the deep sleep stage and that stage is longer in the first half of the night. So to get more longevity sleep, it's preferable to go to bed before midnight. I'm going to change the angle and mention some scientific data on what happens when we don't get enough sleep. Many physiological functions are impacted. The immune system goes down. Lower testosterone production, even in young, healthy males. Cognition and memory go down. Sugar cravings. Risk for obesity and uh, cardiovascular disease go up. An increased incidence of depression. It sounds logical that none of the above are conducive to longevity. In the previous two videos, I was describing how insufficient sleep impacts the mechanisms behind the aging, how it accelerates uh, the reasons for aging. Establishing a direct cause and effect relationship between not enough high quality sleep and shorter lifespan uh, or faster physiological aging is more complex. Nonetheless, there are still some scientific studies uh, that point at that from different angles. What this study is saying, as far as the sleep is concerned, two items are associated with longevity. First, going to bed earlier and at a regular time, and sleeping seven to eight hours a day. And second, maintaining slow wave sleep, and the latter occurs more earlier in the night. Let's look at another study. It followed 21,000 twins for 22 years. What we are seeing is that people who sleep 7 to 8 hours have the lowest risk of mortality. 
Here, of course, we have to factor in that, for example, in younger individuals, a shorter sleep would increase the risk of, for example, a death from a motor vehicle accident and hence lead to an increase in mortality, which is not the same as faster physiological aging. Yet an association between better sleep and longer life is traceable in older individuals as well. And now some easy practical tips for better sleep. Those easy practical tips are related to improving sleeping conditions and establishing a sleeping routine. And some of them may sound very basic. On the other hand, someone may find them helpful as a reminder. The first one is darkness. Darkness is absolutely essential for high quality sleep. Sleep can be disrupted even by a street light shining a little bit into the window. So unless you already have complete darkness in your bedroom and you have, for example, blackout drapes, consider getting a sleeping mask. You can probably get a couple of those on Amazon for $10. The second one is temperature. It should be on the cooler side. Consider setting your thermostat for the night at 60 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 15 to 22 degrees Celsius. And an average recommendation is 65 degrees um, Fahrenheit or 18 degrees Celsius. The third tip. If you, like most of us these days, are afflicted with late night looking at your smartphone screen and reading something from it, consider listening to an audiobook instead. This way, your sleep pattern is not getting affected by the blue light from the smartphone and an easy listen may help you fall asleep. Fourth, make an effort to establish a regular sleeping routine, which is go to bed and wake up at about the same time every day. As a side note, do not get confused by the conclusions from the scientific studies that show that people who slept more than eight hours a day also had a higher risk of mortality and they lived less than people who slept seven to eight hours a day. You can't sleep more than you need. You won't be able to fall asleep or to stay asleep. If all of a sudden you need longer sleep and that continues for some time, that does not mean that you should cut down on how long you sleep. What it means is that something's going on, something's wrong, and your body is trying to fix the issue and that's why it needs more sleep. So if that situation continues, a better idea is to go to a doctor for a medical examination. And some more advanced tips for better sleep. If you follow the sleep hygiene recommendations, but still wake up tired most of the time, consider doing a test for sleep apnea. That may be the reason. The second recommendation is about the optimal time to sleep. There are definitely individual variations and the jury is still out there on some aspects. However, it appears that for the majority of adults, the optimal window for sleep is 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Also, earlier I was describing the importance of the deep sleep stage that happens more earlier in the night. And the way our inner clock works, the best window for the most restorative sleep is 8 p.m. to 12 a.m. So even if you are an owl, Consider going to bed at 11 p.m. instead of 1 a.m. And if you are not an owl, consider even an earlier bedtime. The sleep. Free, pleasant, and very good for you. The next one on our list is nutrition. Note that no amount of physical exercise and good sleep are going to counteract poor nutrition. How exactly does nutrition influence longevity? In three ways. Not getting sufficient amounts of the critically important nutrients that the body needs to function optimally. Second, consuming more food than the body needs, overeating, especially easy calories. And three, 
consuming substances that are detrimental for health, for example, trans fats, sugars, and majority of the processed foods that contain artificial ingredients and sometimes outright toxic substances that our bodies did not evolve to process. And what foods and types of diets are associated with longevity? First of all, definitely, raw fruits and vegetables. Second, you will look at the world's longest living populations. Almost none of them have diets heavy in red meat. Or at least the red meat that they consume that's either pasture-raised or wild game. Not the type of red meat that you would typically see in a grocery store in North America. And the third, some type of a caloric restriction. For example, intermittent fasting through a number of mechanisms is likely to move a person towards their maximum health span and lifespan. And now, some easy practical tips on nutrition. Number one. No matter what your diet, ketogenic or vegetarian or anywhere in between, increase the share of raw leafy green vegetables. You don't need to become a vegetarian or start eating salads three times a day. Just one meal a day started with a green leafy salad. This way you'll probably end up eating less, your body will get fiber, nutrients, and also gradually your body will be learning to crave healthy food. The second one is cut down on the processed food. The third advice comes hand in hand with the second one. If you remember, in the beginning I was saying that implementing any health or anti-aging changes it's not only about what, it's about how. So the tip number three is healthy eating doesn't start in the kitchen. It actually starts in the grocery store. It's much easier to not eat unhealthy food if there is no such food at home. Unfortunately, such is the reality in North America that by default we have to assume that a food item is not good for you, especially if it's packaged. So make it a habit to read food labels. And do not go to a grocery store hungry. If costs, budget, shopping time are an issue, consider frozen fruit, berries and vegetables. They are less expensive than the fresh ones, while preserving most of the nutrients, and they are easy to pull from a freezer. Number 5. Research shows that people often mistake hunger for thirst. We end up overeating while the body was actually asking for water. Before you conclude you are hungry, make sure you drink enough water. And how about an advanced recommendation on nutrition for longevity? You might have heard of glycemic index and glycemic load. A glycemic index value is assigned to a food based on how fast it raises blood sugar. A glycemic load value is calculated based on the glycemic index and the amount of carbohydrates per serving of that food. Glucose is assigned the glycemic index value of 100, which means that one gram of glucose has one unit of glycemic load. Or in other words, one unit of glycemic load approximates the effects of eating one gram of glucose. The higher the glycemic index and the glycemic load, the sharper the fluctuations in the blood sugar. And what happens uh, is that high blood sugar and sharp fluctuations in the blood sugar lead to the accelerated aging and chronic disease. For this reason, watching glycemic index and glycemic load is not just for people who already have diabetes. It's for people who want to slow down their aging and delay the onset of age-related chronic disease. Low glycemic index and glycemic load diet at least in mice, was shown to extend life, and it's much easier to adhere to than, say, a caloric restriction. Therefore, here is the advanced recommendation on nutrition. As much as you can, try to incorporate in your diet 
raw, low glycemic load fruits and vegetables. An example of low glycemic load fruits and vegetables is cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, carrots, apples, strawberries. And even if you deviate from raw produce, try to stick to foods that have the glycemic load below 10. Below 10 is a low glycemic load. High glycemic load is that above 20. For now, just one example on the glycemic load in a serving of food. 150 gram cup of shelled edamame has 15 grams of carbohydrates. Edamame has glycemic index of about 16. And then the glycemic load of one cup of edamame is about 2.5. Compare that to two slices of white bread with a glycemic load of 20. Below and in the video description, I included the link to the tables of glycemic load in foods. Some other healthy items that are very highly desirable in a longevity diet. Wild-caught fatty fish, healthy non-animal fats, for example, organic extra virgin olive oil first cold press. If cost is a consideration, Spanish and Greek oils are typically less expensive than the Italian ones. And avocados, of course. Number four, natural probiotics. For example, kefir, also known as coindeps. Number five, consider sea vegetables. For example, kelp, wakame. The next one on our list of anti-aging pillars is physical activity. First of all, how much physical activity do we need for the optimal functioning? At least 150 to 300 minutes a week of moderate level activity or 75 to 150 minutes a week of vigorous activity. But what if we view physical activity or the exercise as a tool for achieving the maximum lifespan and health span? How much do you need then? you will likely get the maximum life extension, so to say, from an hour a day of being physically active. And out of that, some 35 to 40% has to be high intensity. That's 20-25 minutes a day. To encourage you, however, even a little bit is better than nothing. Studies show that exercising even one or two times a week still leads to a reduction in mortality. About what exactly is meant under the moderate level activity and vigorous activity. Some examples of vigorous activity are shoveling, bicycling, walking or hiking at a brisk pace, which is about 4.5 miles an hour, or jogging at 6 miles an hour. It basically means an elevated heart rate. Some examples of moderate level activity include leisurely walking 3.5 to 4 miles an hour or for example doing some washing at home maybe washing windows or vacuuming i can imagine no one doubts that being physically active allows staying younger and healthier but let's look at some studies the first one i'm about to show is a systematic review that looked at 13 cohort studies each of which examined a link between physical activity and mortality or longevity. The conclusion that it came to, a net gain in life from moderate to vigorous physical activity was half a year to almost seven years. An average conservative estimate is between two and four years. Higher than moderate physical activity had more pronounced effects. People who were engaged in vigorous aerobic exercise were gaining four to eight years of life. And note, greater life expectancy is not associated with more years of frailty. We are seeing an increase in disability-free years of life. Here is another study. The study looked at over 8,000 people in Sweden, ages 60 to 96. The participants were followed for 11 years. The results. Participants still alive in the follow-up measure 
were more physically active on a moderate level. Being active two to three times a week or more was related to a 28% lower risk of not being alive at the follow-up measure. And now some simple recommendations on the physical exercise. They will be more about how than about what. So if you are not hitting the recommended minimal 75 to 300 minutes a week, depending on the intensity of physical exercise, or the highly desirable for the maximum lifespan extension, one hour a day with 35 to 40% of that being high intensity, what do you do? You increase just a little bit. The best place to start is by examining your particular reasons. Do you feel like you are too tired in the evenings? Or do you not have enough time? Or is it just too difficult to start a major new routine? So let's get creative. Some simple suggestions. How about light stretching or doing push-ups or doing some basic yoga moves when you are watching TV in the evening or watching your child on the playground? Some other suggestions. Instead of reading a book on a couch, Listen to an audiobook when you walk. Watch a movie when you are on a treadmill. Take a brisk walk during lunch. Take stairs instead of taking an elevator. To increase the likelihood that you will work out, leave a visual cue for yourself. For example, leave out your workout clothes by your bed or by your workplace. Or leave in a visible place A picture of yourself where you looked your best. Yes, we are talking about physical exercise for anti-aging, but some people are more motivated by the prospect of looking their best. And in the end, it doesn't matter what the motivation or the trigger is as long as it works. Now, everyone is different and some people may get discouraged by seeing the better version of themselves in the past. And if that's your case, then just scratch out the last suggestion and how about this one? Think about the least busy time in your typical day and set a daily reminder for that time to take a 15-minute walk. Remember, something is better than nothing, and the biggest challenge is typically just to start. A more advanced recommendation on the physical activity if you are already somewhat physically active. We need three components, aerobic exercise, strength training, and stretching for flexibility. Even people who are typically good with a strength training and aerobic exercise often underestimate the importance of stretching. I personally find it the easiest and the most pleasant of the three. With the regular stretching, as a minimum, you will get more flexible, leaner and longer muscles, and you will also have an improved blood flow and you will help your lymphatic system. We will also look at one study on exercise in conjunction with the cognitive health and that will be under the cognitive health section of this video. The next one on our list is sunlight exposure. Why do we need sunlight for longevity? It's not just because of the vitamin D. Recent studies suggest that the vitamin D levels may be a biomarker of sun exposure, but not necessarily a goal in itself. What many other studies suggest is that lower sun exposure correlates with higher mortality. So why do we need sunlight exposure? The first reason is better circadian rhythm, which leads to better sleep, which leads to better health. The second one is an improved mood and lower incidence of depression, which leads to better emotional well-being. Then, sunlight exposure affects nitric oxide production in the body. And nitric oxide is a key signaling molecule in our bodies. It's necessary for the proper blood flow. It's also a neurotransmitter and it also impacts other neurotransmitters, which in turn impact many different functions. And the next question is, how much sun exposure do we need? Studies that are trying to establish that 
typically use vitamin D levels as a benchmark. And I have just listed other reasons which are likely more important than just vitamin D levels. Nonetheless, as far as the study conclusions are concerned, it's 10 to 30 minutes a day, several times a week. However, everyone is different and I don't think that those 10 to 30 minutes a day is sufficient for everyone. I personally feel that I need between 30 minutes to an hour per day and I don't even have dark skin. People with dark skin need more sun exposure. So bottom line is, try to pay attention at how you feel and try to establish how much sun you personally need. If you are not getting sufficient sun exposure now, try adding just a 10 minute walk per day in the sun and that will make a difference. And for those who do not get enough sun in the winter, at least for the circadian rhythm and for the winter blues, there are sun lamps. In the description to this video, I included a link to my last year's post on Instagram about sun lamps. The good news about the cognitive function is that it's strongly influenced by other pillars – nutrition, sleep, physical activity, psychological well-being. By taking care of the above factors, you are simultaneously investing in keeping your brain younger. However, there is an additional twist. Numerous studies of people who are cognitively young at an advanced age strongly suggest that those people don't mind going out of their way, don't mind going out of their comfort zone to master a new skill. For example, learn a foreign language, learn dancing, learn to play a musical instrument, acquire expertise in a new field. The trick to staying motivated is to pick something that really excites you. Perhaps it's something that you have been wanting to do for a very long time, but have been postponing it. How about Latin dancing, tango, karate, learning to speak Russian perhaps, or learning a more unique language such as Basque. Our cognitive efforts, our cognitive work have a direct impact on the usefulness of our cognitive function. And the obvious at this point recommendation is consider learning a new skill. The second point on the usefulness of the cognitive function is that nutrition influences the brain function. Several foods have been linked to a better brain function. They are, surprise, leafy green vegetables, also fatty fish, primarily because of the marine omega-3s in the fatty fish. Also, berries, walnuts, tea and coffee. Talking about omega-3s, the type of omega-3 that our brain cells need for their membranes is called DHA. That's an omega-3 of marine origin. Walnuts are also high in omega-3s, but a different type, it's called alpha-linolenic acid. The conversion of alpha-linolenic acid, ALA, into DHA in our bodies is very limited. Nonetheless, it still happens. So for people who are on a strictly vegetarian diet, that's still an option. Then, one frequently overlooked nutrient is choline. Choline is an essential nutrient. It's a muscle donor and, among other things, it participates in the neurotransmitter synthesis. And here is one interesting study on the impact of the choline intake. The study looked at almost 1400 people. It evaluated their choline intake from 1991 to 1995 and then 1998 to 2001. Those who were taking more choline in the past now had less associated brain deterioration as shown by the MRI scans. Those who were taking more choline recently had better scores on verbal memory and visual memory. The best dietary sources of choline are beef flavor, eggs, scallops, wheat germ, salmon, brussels sprouts, broccoli. I personally have been taking a choline supplement for years. 
What else can we do for the cognitive usefulness? If you remember earlier in the video, I concluded the physical activity section by saying that as a part of advanced recommendations, we'll look at one study that links physical activity to the cognitive health. And that is the study. The publication that I'm about to show, it's about a clinical trial that enrolled 132 cognitively normal adults, ages 20 to 67. The participants were randomly assigned into one of the two groups. The first group was doing aerobic exercise three to four times a week for 30 to 40 minutes after a warm-up at 75% of the maximum heart rate. The second group was doing toning and stretching. Keep in mind that toning and stretching is important too, however, this particular study is looking at the impact on the cognitive function, particularly the executive function. First of all, what is the maximum heart rate? Ideally, it's established individually, but generally speaking, it's linked to the age. For example, the maximum heart rate for a 30-year-old person is on average 190 beats per minute. At the age of 40, it's 180. At the age of 50, it's 170. At the age of 60, it's 160 beats per minute, etc. And then the 75% of the maximum heart rate which was used in that clinical trial for a 50-year-old person is going to be 128 beats per minute. The first conclusion from the study. Aerobic exercise for six months, but not toning and stretching, improved cognitive function, primarily executive function, in all participants, and more so in older people. What this finding suggests is that aerobic exercise is more likely to improve age-related declines in executive function rather than increase performance in those without a decline. Or in other words, that's a reversal of the cognitive aging. And that is the first outcome and conclusion from the study. The second conclusion. Cortical thickness in the participants was measured with MRI. What's cortical thickness? It measures the combined thickness of the layers of the cerebral cortex in mammalian brains. Cerebral cortex is also called or known as gray matter. Many studies indicate that general intelligence or intellectual abilities in humans are positively associated with the thickness of the cerebral cortex. And the MRI scans in the studies that I have just told you about showed an increase in the cortical thickness in a particular area in the participants in the aerobic exercise group. If we were to summarize and simplify, 120 to 160 minutes a week of aerobic exercise at 75% of the maximum heart rate will lead to the rejuvenation of the cognitive function. Let's now look at the toxic substances that can definitely shorten life or to be exact at avoiding those toxic substances. Up to a certain extent, our bodies can withstand toxicity. Yet, you will simplify your body's job of maintaining health by minimizing pesticides, plastics, other toxic ingredients. The first one on our list is pesticides. What's the easiest thing to do? To the extent that you can buy organic items that would have the most pesticides in their conventional counterparts. For example, apples, strawberries. And it's better to not buy them at all if you cannot find organic. I took this screenshot from the Environmental Working Group website and I also included the link. Also, don't spray pesticides in your backyard. Second, plastic food containers. Replace with glass or stainless steel. 3. Water in plastic bottles. BPA is not the only harmful ingredient that can leak from plastics into water. 4. Most of the non-stick cookware contain polytetrafluoroethylene, PTFE. When overheated, they release a harmful ingredient for short, PFOA, which has been shown to cause cancer in laboratory animals. Replace with cast iron or stainless steel cookware. 5. Air fresheners. 
eliminate altogether or replace with essential oils. Six, look out for harsh and toxic ingredients in cleaning products. I showed some of them on the slide. I left the most complex one for the end, psychological and emotional well-being. That's a huge topic, bigger than the other pillars of anti-aging and unfortunately frequently overlooked. At least in the Western cultures, we tend to focus on the external manifestations, things that we can see or easily measure or something with a straightforward cause and effect relationship, forgetting about the importance of the state of mind. That is also a very complex topic, first of all, because no one chooses to be sad and lonely or depressed or upset. And second, it's also much easier to, for example, eat a salad or go for a walk than change one's emotional disposition. Nonetheless, there is still a lot we can do to improve our own psychological and emotional well-being to live longer. Why is the psychological health important? How does it impact our longevity? As an example, most people probably heard about psychosomatic reactions. That's when a physical ailment is caused by nothing else but the person's psychological state. Many studies link prolonged negative emotional states to a heightened risk for a variety of health conditions. Some examples of those negative emotional states are depression, anger, anxiety, hostility, chronic stress. A very clear link is traced between those negative emotional states and cardiovascular diseases. It doesn't mean that there is no link between the negative emotions and other diseases, but if we are to look for solid scientific evidence, uh, the most of that exists for the cardiovascular disease. Now, that's the negative impact. How about the positive ones? positive emotions, better health and longer life. Such information also exists. Many studies show that adults who have meaningful connections with other people live longer. If you look at the blue zones, the world's longest living populations, one of the hallmarks is happiness, underpinned also, among other things, by connection with other people, and frequently a sense of purpose uh, in life. And now let's look at some more precise data. This is a very large systematic review by the Harvard School of Public Health. Study conclusion. Positive psychological well-being, feeling pleasures from life, is associated with a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease. And this study looked at two cohorts, almost 70,000 women and 1,400 men in the second cohort. And what we see is that the most optimistic people live almost 15% longer than the least optimistic people, independent of many other factors. We are talking about some 8 to 15 extra years of life. And optimism is not something mysterious. Yes, it's a personality trait and it's partially a result of our upbringing and it's also impacted by our socio-economic status and our circumstances in life. Yet, it can also be a conscious cognitive choice. You can make a decision to be optimistic, to train yourself to be optimistic and to undertake some steps to stay in that state. What would be suitable generic suggestions on the psychological and emotional well-being so that we could live longer? I narrowed down the list of tips and suggestions that I could talk about to just several items that hopefully most people will find straightforward. And if you are already doing some or all of them, take a note and compliment yourself on doing the right thing. And we are going to start with optimism. How do you stay more optimistic? One of the easiest things to do is turn off the news. 
or don't read the news. You will notice that you are much happier if you are not constantly bombarded by the negativity of the mass media. And obviously, I'm not talking about the professional news or news in the areas of your personal development. For example, I'm not suggesting that people who are trading stocks and cryptocurrencies stop reading financial news or business news. The second thing you can do that can contribute to your happiness and optimism is identifying and removing from your life people who are toxic to you. No one is perfect. No relationship is perfect and it's normal to have disagreements from time to time. Also, everyone is sometimes going through rough patch in their life. However, if you are consistently feeling down or feeling a lowered sense of self-worth after interacting with a particular person, it's a red flag that maybe it's time to part ways with that person. And it's not about labeling someone good or bad, it's about taking care of your inner state. Suggestion number three, cleanse your life of complaining and negativity. Do you remember one of the first or maybe the first self-improvement books, Dale Carnegie, 1948, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living, 1936, How to Win Friends. And one of his phrases, do not condemn, complain, or criticize. As far as our own behavior is concerned, it's a matter of making conscious choice and sticking to it. As far as other people are concerned, and we cannot change other people, that would be a subtype of toxic behavior. And the issue here is that emotions are contagious. Again, I'm not talking about situations when someone is going through a rough phase in their life and needs our support, or sometimes we need a shoulder to cry on. I'm talking about people who have a lifelong modus operandi when they are complaining, criticizing, and sharing negative information that evokes in others feelings of despair, anxiety, depression, anger. And yes, it is possible that our positivity and our optimism may have a healing impact on others. But at the same time, people that we interact with have an impact on us. As adults, of course, we know that no situation is black and white and an appropriate reaction to a situation requires taking into account multiple factors. Still, all other factors being equal, you will benefit from removing from your life negativity and complaining. The next suggestion for the improved emotional well-being. Instead of starting your day with looking at your email or social media accounts, start every morning by asking yourself these questions, or maybe some of your own questions. What do I really want in life? What is one thing I can realistically do today that I will enjoy? What are my plans for today? What are three things in life I'm grateful for? And by the way, the state of gratitude, feeling gratitude is one of the most powerful tools at our disposal that we can use to balance, to improve our psychological and emotional well-being thus improving our health and increasing our chances for exceptional longevity. What you dwell upon grows. I'm saying this in relation to all the suggested questions I listed. Suggestion number five, nurture and improve existing relationships. Not only a relationship within a couple, but friendships too require nurturing or a relationship can fall apart or it's never too late to build new relationships. Look for people who have the same values as you do. Or set yourself a weekly or a monthly reminder to reconnect with someone from your past, someone, a friendship with whom you valued, but you drifted apart. Suggestion number six, be attentive to yourself. Know your limits and know when to stop. 
This is a picture from my car. I drove into a gas station with the gas tank completely empty. Don't do this to yourself. A car is easy to refill. A human is not. Know when to stop and restore. If you feel that you are approaching your limits, stop. You need to recharge. A somewhat more advanced suggestion is to try meditations. Even if you've never done that before, there are many free resources with guided meditations. And meditations can do miracles for your state of mind. And finally, remember, the psychological, the emotional well-being, along with the cognitive health, is strongly influenced by the other pillars, sleep, nutrition, physical activity, getting sunlight exposure. If you take care of the above factors, your emotional well-being will be consistently much better. And let's do a quick bonus one on looking younger. A lot of skin aging comes from the sun damage. The typical recommendation is to wear a sunblock whenever you go outside. I personally don't like applying and wearing sunblock. If neither do you, I'll share with you my solution. A sun hat with wide brims and summer gloves or driving gloves. I think hats never go out of style and you will save yourself a lot of time, effort, and money on the rejuvenation of aging skin. A long video today, wasn't it? Even though I barely scratched the surface on each of the topics. Let's add some really high level points to keep in mind. It's always easier to prevent than to correct once broken. The best time to start anti-aging is now. As I was mentioning earlier in the video, implementing any anti-aging changes to achieve your maximum lifespan is not only about what, it's about how. And even small changes, small steps when done consistently will make a big difference. All the anti-aging factors are interconnected and impact each other on many levels. If you start with at least something, the rest is more likely to follow. Where does it leave us? From the long list of suggestions in this video, pick just several items that speak to you, that sound easy, and start practicing them. The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. I have not yet decided on the topic for the next video, but I'm leaning towards sharing with you my personal experience with a three-day long fast. See you next time.